And we go! So welcome everyone, we're having our panel on sound and music making. I made, I made that, that name, uh, sorry, it was not great, I might have been a bit stressed. But I think it, the content's going to be amazing because we have some amazing people with us here who are all well, working in the games industry with either sound and music or sound and music, I guess. Let's do a bit of an intro. Let's start here. Uda. Yeah. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Uda and I work with the sound and music at uh, Knock Knock Audio, which is a game audio company that I have with Martin. My name is Martin and I work at uh, Knock Knock Audio with Uda. Uh, she does a lot of music and sound really well. I do sound design sometimes and I also work with uh, this company called Quillbyte in Norway who did this game called Among the Sleep and stuff like that. So uh, we're the Norwegians of this panel, like the complementary Norwegians. Always need some. Hi, my name is Alexandria and I work as a freelance composer. I also do some sound design and yeah, I work with different companies. As you understand, as freelance, I have a studios, Kudu Studios, and I work sometimes with my husband, Yuvan, who is in the public today. <laughs> yeah, so basically I do game uh, music and um, trailer music, also electronica. Thank you. Uh, hey. Uh, I'm Joel. I'm also a composer and sound designer, mainly making music for games. Um, yeah, I've been in this industry in almost a decade now, I think, but I've been like in and out uh, working with other stuff and studying different things. Uh, yeah. Have you worked on any cool games? You should never ask a game developer that question. Okay, it's more like, you uh, want to name drop something? I've made a lot of, uh, worked a lot of with the uh, Soink games, that's now part of Thunderful. Uh, uh, the game Sticker to the Man, uh, Fee a few years back, uh, audio and uh, all, all things audio with those games. Ville? <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is uh, Ville and I work with my colleague Victor. Uh, we have a company called Sonigon and we do freelance sound design and um, implementation, technical sound design, coding, a bit of everything. A little bit of music, but not that much anymore. Cool, then we know who you are. Uh, so, uh, you all work as freelancers, right? Uh, no, you have Quillbyte as well, right? But part of your time is worked with as uh, someone you hire in into a project. Do you, would you say that's the most common way to do it today? And what would you say is the biggest difference from working in-house? Yes. <laughs> I, and I do think for the people who don't work as freelancers, they do work as like an auxiliary part of the project that comes in with the production team. But it's pretty rare to have um, people on Sound & Music who are full-time at any company, really. It, because we're very, very good and fast at what we do. So no one can be stand or all of our full creative power for too long. <laughs> so uh, yeah, definitely it's uh, true. Yeah, I'd like to add that, like, as you say, um, the production cycle for adding sound and music is a lot shorter than the like, production cycle for like the full development. I mean, it's really common, for example, for to come in at the end of the project. I mean, that's basically kind of a meme <laughs> for us, I think, <laughs> that we have to do an entire game's content in like the end, because you can't like add sounds to stuff that doesn't exist yet. So you come in like usually at the end, I think. Uh, preferably not. Maybe you want to space it out as much as you can, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't remember what the, it was, I remember there was some ratio, like 1 to 20 sound designer to like developers in a team. I don't know, is that a thing? <laughs> I've heard this out of the ether. Yeah, how big are the companies you tend to work with? Uh, I mean, how many employers are there when you get there, you know? Well, it's uh, du uh, double A, for example, for me, and indie games. So they don't usually hire music full-time uh, workers, and at least you have different disciplines that you could jump between. For example, you can implement their SFX, or maybe you can do programming. I mean, there are different disciplines that you could cover up. And then once you finish with the music, you can do something else. Then is of course, chances to be in-house. Yeah, it, um, the size of the team depends a lot on, it's, it's very different from team to team. Um, some teams are maybe, I think the smallest team I've worked with were like three people plus me. Uh, whereas the biggest one is like we're 
around 30, I think, and I'm kind of just an extra sound designer just in case it's too much. So I think maybe that figure is kind of accurate because there's one full, or he's not full time at the moment, but might be soon. Uh, so he does both music and sound effects for the whole game. And then if there's extra need for more help, then I can step in. So it sounds like a pretty accurate thing. Yeah, maybe. I was thinking about the latest project we did. Uh, uh, there was a project where you did the sound design and I did the music. Uh, and that was like... Yeah, uh, there were 20. Yeah, yeah, at least 20. Maybe 20 to 30, depending on like how you count and you know, external forces and something like that. But that was just us. But I think it also depends a lot about the type of uh, game you're making. If you have a team that is making chess games full, uh, full on chess games all the time, then it's usually maybe you need some music and a little bit of like sounds and if they have a themed chess game, sure. But if you're making, uh, like for instance, I've worked on uh, horror games a bit. And for horror games, it feels like there's way more uh, of the actual sound that needs to be part of the development and the design. So then, uh, then it would make more sense for like a small team of like 10, 15 people to definitely have a full-time person just to be like in the beginning, in the planning, in the meetings, uh, and to, for it to be like a part of it because it's such a big part of the game. So I definitely think it's a genre based as well. Yeah, I met uh, a few years, uh, maybe two years ago. I don't remember his name, but he was uh, audio director at Control, uh, Remedy Games in Finland. Uh, and I think he said that they had an audio team of like 13 people. We're of like four composers, and then there was like three Foley artists, and then a couple of sound designers, and then implementation artists. And, uh, so it goes like all the way. And that's not even like a big AAA, it's like a small AAA project. So I suppose it uh, differs a lot. But the 21 seems like it might be an ish, unless you do very, yeah, games that. Yeah, but then also like 20 to 1, but none of us were working full time. Mm. Uh, so I think it's even less if you would count like the hours on the project. Yeah. Mm. Also, uh, oh, oh sorry. Hey, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just uh, gonna add that some you can also like scale uh, very well. I think with at the end of the project uh, for us, me and uh, me and my colleague. I mean, we uh, did uh, a complete redesign of a game. It's called uh, Totally Accurate Battlegrounds by Landfall. Um, they came in and they were like, "Hey, we need like all of this." Like they like had a huge like list of requests, and they're like, "It has to be done in a month." And we were like, okay, great, we're going to need like six people. And they're like, okay, sure. Like, <laughs> do we need to worry about budget? And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we just took in like all of our friends and we just like completely revamped the game from the ground up. And everything was done already. Like, we didn't need any like, uh, the assets, everything was done. We just mm -hmm. had to do our part. So you can scale a lot with sound design, I think. So they've implemented shit sound and you... It was it. not, there was a game jam. Ah. So it was not very nice uh, because it was Carl and he didn't done it in it like a weekend and it was a open world game. So, I mean, I don't think anyone, no matter how good, could have done like a, a like a perfect job. So I think we cleaned it up nice. <laughs> cool. Well, what would you say was the dif biggest difference in being in-house or freelance, especially for you, Martin, who's done it all and do it all? Um. I think in-house is very nice because you have um, you have a say in uh, in what you do, and you have a say in the planning cycle, and you can tell them like uh, we need to bring in a composer here, or I need programmer time then, and this. And I think coming from the outside, especially when people hire you for the first time, uh, it is quite often it's like, hey, we're mid-cycle or mid-development or towards the end of the project actually, and can you just come in and fit everything into what or is already there? So when you're in-house, you actually get to kind of create this framework for you to work and do a lot of cool things with. Um, and I do think that's also like not only for people who are in uh, in-house, but it's also for when you end up doing like a jam game and then suddenly you have a team, uh, then you are at the beginning of the of the cycle as well. So you can have that same kind of uh, luxury or like I think it's I think it's really needed for someone if you're having a game to bring someone in, even if it's part-time, even if it's just like for a week, at the beginning of a, of a production that does audio, and have them like, you're going to have shooting, or you're going to have a combat, or you're going to have some beautiful kind of evocative moments, and you know that you're going to have something, make them like prototype it, make it as like a 2D, like a like little musical composition, or like a little, uh, like a little audio thing of like, 
I like that kind of stuff because then the rest of the team has like this this aspect that they can work with that kind of inspires them. And it's very rare that people do that, but I think for everyone on the team, it's also like pretty good and it's pretty cheap to make, pretty cheap to hire someone for like a little bit now and then in a company. Um, I just also remember that I worked on a game with a Swedish guy called Ditto, and we, we did a game called Gunner, and there was actually like uh, two sound, two uh, two people on music and audio, and one person developing it. So I've, I've been on the other side where we outnumber them, and that's been very fun. Them, yeah. <laughs> you what? Uh, I was just thinking, because when I was working on Fee, I was actually sitting in-house. I was working freelance, but I had like an, a space in their office. I was the only one with my own office room at the space, because I need to, because I'm working with audio. Uh, but I really, really enjoyed being that close to the team, uh, like the social part. How early in the project were, did they include you? Because that's quite an atmospheric game. Right? Uh, yeah, I was there from very early. I was actually... Mm, I have to think. I think I even started working like from that office uh, from the game we did before, mm. which was something completely different called Zombie Vikings. You don't need to play it if you haven't already. Uh, so I was already, already in-house and I pretty much took that job because they told me that I was going to do fear afterwards. Mm. Uh, so that was kind of uh, something You could live with Vikings if you get to do fear. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so I was... I, it felt like I was a big part of uh, the project, uh, and I was like taking lunches every day with the art directors and game directors, um, and I think that made a huge difference for that game. Uh, that it was such, such so much focus on atmosphere and mm, soft values, as we call the art part of <laughs> making games. Um, but yeah, that was a huge thing, and it's very different from just sitting at a random place and like send files over and don't know what happens with them. Uh, it's a very different process. Do you have anything? I never worked in a house, so <laughs> <laughs> I waved this question. But do you sometimes feel when you get the project that I wished we'd been here from the start, we could have done so much more? Um, uh, with, with the sound picture, I guess you call it? Well, what do you mean? like? Like, if I'd been here early on, we could have worked, you know, in systems that could have used mm. the sound in better, make better ambience to, I mean, yeah, because now you're just going to get, like, a, here's our template. No one really cared much about sound, I guess, so mm. we just made it make noise. Yeah, I, I think uh, coming in early uh, with a developer, I mean, it's very beneficial to set the style early, I think. I think that also can help the developer to, you know, uh, help them realize further what the kind of game they're making or help reinforce that like sort of theme. Like if you're making a, like a shooter game, uh, they're making a shooter game and it has a, like a silly vibe to it. If you make silly prototype sounds, then that's going to help them in that direction a bit, I think. But also coming in early and like saying, okay, you're listening to their pitch or whatever, like, oh, this is what we want to do. Like, uh, we need uh, this sort of functionality and you're supposed to go into like rooms and stuff and it's going to be this kind of you know ambience is needed or whatever you know whatever their specifications are then you can say oh when then you need to think about this 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 and this and this and you have to think about this now and you have to prepare that for me when I can come in and like actually make the sounds it's really important cuz i mean we did that with landfall actually we came, they didn't have any functionality we had to do all the functionality and make all of the sounds at the same time in a month I don't recommend that at all. It's very stressful. Uh, so I think it's really good to come in early, both to set the tone and to also like help them figure out the tech that they need so they can make it properly from the from the start. Oh yeah, yeah. Just, oh, you, you I might I add something. I never work in house, but I can only guess. And what for Roman I've heard, it's like totally different schedule. Of course, it's not like you work from eight to five when you freelance. You have your own schedule. You're flexible. You're you don't really know when, when is the weekend. Like, you don't have weekends, you know? <laughs> Your days and the week starts when, when you decide it. And, of course, you have deadlines. And about deadlines, it's different things. Also, when it comes to freelance, you have shorter deadlines, much more stress, because sometimes it just pops up, the project, and you need to, yeah, figure it out and fix it really quickly. But when you work in-house, you have longer days, and, yeah, pacing is totally different. So you work on it, like, yeah, years, I mean. So, yeah, what I've heard from a um, girl who worked in, in house. Mm -hmm. So she said she can be pretty over overwhelmed when it's uh, freelance work, but when she works in house, it's like, yeah, it's like normal day, yeah, working day. So it feels good in, on one side, but the, do you not use the work schedule? Uh, does the freelance work not allow you to have that pacing of an ordinary day job? 
Uh, I work very closely to an ordinary day job. My weekends are extremely holy. I do not work on weekends, uh, like period. Mm. Uh, but also I had like a, 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 I was on sick leave for a year, uh, shortly after a fear for, uh, what do you call it, uh, what do you call it in English? Burnouts. Burnout things, yeah. yeah. So I have to be like really, really strict after that. Okay. Um, but at Fee, you said you were there for the whole project, so that means you would have worked kind of work hour thing. Uh, I was working or? like a half-ish time on Fee, okay. but then I was in seven bands and touring and recording mm. and stuff. Uh, so it was uh, it was freelance. That that was like before I had weekends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> weekends is a good idea. You should have three days weekend if you can. Yeah, you know, sometimes get deadlines that are really press pressing you, and like freelance, you some days you have nothing at all, and then suddenly you got thousands of things to finish, and that, that's the biggest difference, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I think I've learned over the years to also be like really, really like pushing the studio to like have a proper planning, and like because often if you don't, you have the same deadline as they do, but you can't start working before they're done, mm -hmm. so you have one day. Uh, and you have to like be really, really on. Like, I will need these like months to do this work. You have to plan for this. Yeah. And I just don't like put up. If they don't plan and we break the deadline, we do. That's not my responsibility, really. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of these like freelancing challenges that you're mentioning here it was like one of the main reasons that we decided to start a company to be begin with. Because now we're kind of hitting the sweet spot between being freelance and being like in-house kind of because um, it allows us to have like alleviate each other if we have we have a lot of projects going on at the same time and we are three people in the company so if one project suddenly needs a lot of attention we can just like focus more of our resources on that one project or if there's not really that much then we can just work on other stuff and as both Martin and Ali that is the third person in our company uh, she's employed at two other places as well um, so a lot of jobs going I'm the only one working full-time at our company at, the, at this uh, moment um, but yeah we're, we're able to be really flexible and go on to latch on to the things that are needed at the moment and um, kind of avoid having these huge because with the games, you have the, 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 the delays and stuff, and ev suddenly you have a big pile of work that you didn't anticipate. And being freelance in that situation can be very stressful when you have multiple deadlines in the same week and stuff. Um, so I feel like that was a good thing with like making a company now, is that we can kind of work a bit freelance-ish with the flexibility, but also be a bit more stable. And having those um, the stability of working over time and stably, uh, it also kind of minimizes the press pressure you get uh, when suddenly like these kind of projects match up and have the same release dates and stuff like that, because you have had a bunch of time to do like the proper groundwork uh, and figure out the style and uh, such things. But if you are if you are suddenly we have a month to do something, you don't have much time for trial and error. So you're basically betting on that nothing goes wrong, and if it does it will impact something else. Uh, and that is a risk that is just, it just sucks. And uh, it's very often where that sound designers and composers are being placed in that situation. And it's pretty bad planning from the company's side. And it's avoidable. Um, a friend of mine actually said a good number, just for people who actually run a company here, to think of uh, you should slot around 12% uh, percentage of your budget for audio. Uh, then you will get amazing audio, like supreme. It will be amazing. It will be integrated. Instead of being patched over like wounds as a band-aid, it will be like a core part of the experience. It will be uh, like a Disney movie that's been dubbed instead of the German we talk over the... Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but at least like nothing under 5% is like a good rule. If you have under 5% as a, as a budget like, uh, thing, then it's, there's going to be problems, quite likely. Uh, so yeah, budgets, 5 to 10% depending on your kind of game. That was a good thing. I also uh, really like the sentiment about colleagues and stuff. Uh, that's like a huge asset, I think, that um, is like 
uh, but for me, example, with my, with my colleague, like we can scale really easily. And also it minimizes uh, the risk aspect a lot because you know that when you sit next to a person and you work with them every day like we do or you, know, you just work really tightly, then you know that you can hand over something to this person and they will like get it really quickly. You don't have to like onboard them and maybe they can't really deliver and there's some miscommunication, blah, blah, blah. You're like, okay, I need offloading and then it's like instant instead of a long onboarding and you have to write contracts. I mean, if you're in the same company, then all of that is really easy. Yeah, and another thing that we just talked about a bit earlier is that uh, when you're in-house, you are there for years and you know the people and you work really closely with them, but as a freelancer, you're often just put in sometime mid-project, maybe towards the end, and everyone else knows each other super well and you're kind of just there, okay, okay, so how do I navigate this group? <laughs> um, but when we are now three people, we kind of actually have colleagues. Uh, which is very nice to have that stability over time that you you know you're gonna see the same people day in and day out even though you're still working on projects with very different teams and it feels weird if you've been working with a team for two years and then it's release day and it's like okay well it's nice working with you I don't know if I'll see you again but it was nice but with uh, with a like full-time position in-house or having a an actual company team, it, it's not the same. You, you, don't, you know you're going to see the people again. It's really valuable. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess I got lucky with Stanlock Studios because I've been working with them many years <laughs> as a freelance. So it's, it's amazing. Still, still here, still with you. <laughs> you are. I think also have it like that building that relationship, as you say, like it takes a long time and then you just leave the company that you have been working and work then like creating this relationship with to have like long term colleagues that you know you're, like, you're going to work for years and years and it's not going to be like a concrete end to it, like the project's going to end and then you're not going to see them again. I mean, that's, that's huge. And like for me, like with my colleague, we're starting to like mind meld now. I mean, it's. <laughs> And that's, that's, that all takes a long time, you know, but now it's like you have this really intimate thing with someone where you can like really quickly do stuff together. And I think that's a huge asset when you're working, for sure. So would you, for our aspiring devs here, would you uh, recommend them to start a studio, early? even if you're going to work freelance, to do it with an, a partner or a Yeah, a I would. I would advise the partner up. It's harder to find work because you have to find work for two people, but if you're just like uh, quitting school and you're willing to be a bit scrappy and live on like we lived on beans and tomato sauce for like a couple of years there it was a bit tight but it worked out for us and uh, now I think it's it's amazing I would not want to work alone no never <laughs> I love my colleague <laughs> he's not here I work alone and I would love not to <laughs> so if anybody feels like team up I'm available yes yeah, like do you ever hire each other when it gets busy like are you a little community I thought of we that. All, we were close to. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But Alexandra, as you said, you. Yeah, you I was. I was. I thought about to collaborate with other uh, composers mm -hmm. to. Yeah, just sometimes you get overloaded and you want to share the cake. I mean, <laughs> no problem with that. So probably, I mean, in in the future, I might consider that. But I mean, I guess all humans want to have someone to. In Swedish, we say bolla. You know, the, someone to discuss the, the work you do with. So being the only one doing something, I can understand it gets quite heavy in, in the head, right? Yeah, if but at the same no time for me, like composing has always been like a really like personal and almost private process. And I feel like it's really, really difficult to share that with someone. Mm -hmm. I had like a couple of moments, maybe with really like close friends where we were able to like actually create things together. But I'm, I think I'm, um, often, like I need that process to be like my own. But then, then it would be great to have colleagues around, like working with other, pro like you do. You have like your own projects, but you're also like, at some level, share a responsibility. And I think with sound design, it's easier uh, because it's less personal. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree with that. That it can be hard to find someone like a soulmate almost in the music to go be able to create together because you need understanding on a deeper level and um, maybe to have a mentor is better, maybe someone who can advise you and yeah, like my husband. <laughs> he helps me sometimes with the yeah, advices and on the mixing or yeah, general advice on the harmonies and stuff. Yeah, so do you usually get someone from the team who's like the visionary from there and when you come in? Uh, yeah, that is usually the case for me. I usually work very close with an art director or game director 
often it's the same person. Uh, but that, that has been also, like, since I've been working so long with uh, Soink Games and uh, uh, Thunderfall, I've started to develop close relationships with some people there, so the communication is really easy, and they trust me a lot, so I pretty much get to do what I want, and it usually ends up being something that they like. Uh, and that's really, really valuable as well. But that is also like the... Um it's a kind of good thing about being um, in early in a project is that you can actually scope out what the project needs and plan, plan after that. I've been very lucky to work with a bunch of different musicians because uh, I, I can do both body, sound and music, but I'm definitely quicker at sound, right? So if, I, if I'm at the project and I feel like I can't really compose this, it's kind of like a nice relief because uh, I can work with someone who's like the other half of the, of the whole sound image. and. Um, and, I, and I, then I feel like it's it's very good to actually be able to to look a little bit at what's around and, and uh, even though that is scary, especially if you're working with someone you don't quite know before, that could also like lead to some of the biggest surprises um, and also like challenge you, you to grow a, a lot. Um, so it's definitely like something good with both the safe and the, the new and the unsafe. Like I burnt out because I wasn't I burnt out uh, because I didn't really trust uh, other people with my work. Um, and uh, and after that, it's been very important to actually learn how to do that. You know, it's the whole indie thing, like, oh, my, my work is my passion, my art, that kind of thing. And uh, then it was a bit hard to ask for help. Do you think it's uh, more likely to burn out as a freelancer? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Well, actually, if as a freelancer, you also have the health system and it kind of stuff a bit more stacked against you. At least in Norway and probably Sweden as well, we have this. If you're in a company, you have health benefits, you have unemployment benefits. If you get, like, uh, deaf suddenly, the government will actually fund you getting a different um, education. Mm -hmm. And you have sick leave and parental leave and uh, vacation money and all these things you can have if you're a freelancer, but you have to set them up yourself and it costs extra money. And you have to actually do the job of getting it to happen. Uh, whereas, yeah. Yeah. And get paid fairly as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, yes. Uh, that said, I was actually surprised when I was on sick leave how smooth that worked uh, with the Shackling's Casa. I was like, you know, under the impression that if I'm out, I'm out. I just will get no money. Uh, but I called them. And I have to, like, because I had been employed for like a half a year or somewhere, and they were like, it was a bit like I had to like press them to count both my my own company and my employment. But then I got like, okay, sick leave pay for a year, and I was really surprised how well that worked out. So at least in Sweden there is an okay system. But then yeah, it's the like uh, the regular sick leave if you're like out for a day and the vacation stuff. That's something you have to like take into account when you charge. Yeah, I work. think as a freelancer, it's very important that you have your insurances in place. If you don't, then that's kind of when you're screwed. Uh, but as a company, as an, an employee in our company, that is mandatory that we have the insurances and we have the pension and everything set up. If we don't, then the government is not going to be happy with us. <laughs> um, but as a freelancer, it's more on, on you that you have those things in place, and especially if you're just starting out and think money is a bit tight, so that's maybe not going to be your first priority. You might have to consider buying food instead of insurance, for example. And uh, that, that's not the best situation, especially if you then burn out and you don't have the insurance for it. It's not going to be nice. Then you don't have any food anymore either. Yes, and that's going to be even worse. <laughs> or instruments. Like yes. you always buy new instruments, you know. And then you think about health. <laughs> <laughs> okay. TV. Yeah, there's also, um, actually during COVID in Norway, a lot of performing musicians had to sell their instruments. So it's kind of like a good ba piggy bank, you know. Yeah, I have guitars, cool. I'll sell a guitar a month, I can still eat, I can still do things. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like an investment. That's the pension thing. But I mean, it's also, we are very fortunate to live in a, in a country uh, of, of Sweden or Norway or Denmark or vicinity that has like a good safety net. Like a part of the reason why we wanted to start a company together was I've, I know a few people in America, uh, especially one, uh, Anne Krober, which is a sound designer, who did really, really cool stuff on a bunch of like movies and pioneered a lot of the sounds. Like, for instance, the sound technique of the laser that you hear in Star Wars. Uh, she pioneered that and uh, did a bunch of really, really cool sound design work. 
but she was always like a freelancer. And uh, in the United States, that is very cutthroat and hard to make a stable living. So at some point, when you're at the end of your career or at the point where you're struggling to get things, then you might not be able to have saved up anything. And in America, if you're in that position, you have very little leeway. You know, then, then it's maybe you have some family to take care of you or something like that. But it's just, uh, we're very fortunate that we can screw up in, in, uh, in Scandinavia. And it's mostly fine. But, um, yeah, but it's definitely, I think, for us more uh, good things about having a company than a freelancer. But that's also a personal thing, right? Different people have different things they want to do. I can tell a joke about a Swedish. And then <laughs> Do it. Okay. Because we haven't done any of the questions here, and we're on a totally different level than these, so it felt weird to start reading these. Okay, Please so, go. So why did a Swedish person open the milk carton in the store? It said on the carton, open here. <laughs> 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 what level okay. were your well, questions at? <laughs> I mean, this, you guys told me to talk about this stuff, but now we went into like the problems with freelance work and burnout, and it's like, <laughs> what different parts of the job do you do? I don't know. Yeah, and that kind of stuff. Let's see where we are. Yeah, we we can also ask the audience. Yeah, we will. Oh, yeah, we can okay. see if there's oh, yeah, any right. more good that. questions. Okay. Oh, no, no. Okay. okay, we have our last question. I think there's a, what's the biggest challenge in your work that kind of keeps going on the, on the topic? I, uh, okay. I think the thing that I have been struggling most with, and also like maybe because it's so hard and I don't like it, is getting properly paid. Mm. Uh, and it's so hard to explain to game companies uh, that I'm worth this salary for some reason. It seems obvious for all other professions, but audio, and especially music, I think it's really difficult to. But isn't that part of freelance work? I mean, we artists kind of say the same thing, right? Is it because they will find someone else who's cheaper? Or I mean, for yeah. free? Or for free. Yeah, that's the thing. This is everybody's dream. So it's, but I think it's, I just recently had to like, go through every step of explaining why my consultancy pay should be like, higher than unemployment's hourly rate. Uh, and like, when I broke it out, because he was like, well, this is like, more than double when I pay my employees. Yes, but... Uh, and I have, and I showed him. I also, Verksamt.sc has a really good like calculator where you can like enter uh, what kind of salary you would like to have, and like how many hours you work, and how many like of these hours that you can actually charge for, and uh, it counts for uh, this uh, semester I think, and everything. And you can see like you have to charge 600 crowns per hour or whatever. It's depending on different parameters. Also, uh, the costs you have in your business. So I just showed him that, I like uh, screen shared and like went through that. And then he understood and that's what I got paid eventually. But uh, a lot of people don't seem to understand that. Uh, and then with music it's even more hard because sometimes you also need to sort of explain why music can be worth more than the time it takes to make it. Uh, which is often the case with more like artistic creative content. Uh, because if I'm, if I'm really, really good at what I do, I can make a great song in a day. Uh, but if I'm a little less experienced, that would take me a week. And I shouldn't be paid less because I'm good at what I do. Uh, so that's also always a, a tricky part. And like, should you charge per hour work or should you charge per minute of complete music? And that's, I don't know, I've started like a big... Uh, like an Excel sheet with different parameters that I can like write, okay, it's a three minute song, the complexity level is between one and five, and it's this many layers, and then it pops out a price. Mm -hmm. I also have an X factor that you can enter between one and 10,000. Uh, and uh, so that works surprisingly well, actually. It pops out like similarly estimations to what I've been calculating differently. I can share that with you if you like. This sounds like a, a talk for next year's yeah. conference, Maybe. perhaps. Just uh, an add-on to that as well with the music is that a lot of the plugins and stuff that you buy to make that music that makes it sound good, especially like orchestral libraries and stuff, are so expensive. So you have to take that into account too, that the music that you're making is not just what you're hearing, but it's also all this stuff that you bought in order to make that thing. So yeah. a track is essentially a lot more expensive than what you're going to get paid for. Yeah, and also the case, sorry, yeah, no. <laughs> with the sound design, because uh, we talked about yesterday, your colleague Victor has spent like months and months and months of unpaid work creating sound libraries. Uh, and 
so the, the time that you actually charge for has to cover for that as well. Uh, so there has to be this like pretty large margin uh, that can cover for all the time you put in. Like we are here now, we're not getting paid for like these two full days. Uh, we have to sh charge for this time as well to, uh, to be able to sustain this kind of work. And I think a lot of people forget that. Yeah, I totally agree about uh, the, the fair <laughs> pricing per paying. hour because a different music is made differently. Like sometimes you have uh, scaled uh, like to the one or two tracks uh, composition, but sometimes it's a full orchestra and it can take like weeks to, to make it properly and finalize it. And don't forget about levels and mastering and limiting and all these kind of things that you also do on the top of that composition. Like you do your your equalizing and I don't know if people don't understand probably what I'm talking about, but it's like a technical things that you have to do with the music to make it sound good on the different systems, for example. And it also takes time and um, all the plugins that you have to buy, as you mentioned, Uda, like it can cost between uh, yeah, 6,000, no, from, from 1,000 to 6,000 crowns. And yeah, if you get paid uh, a little <laughs> fee, so it's, it's really hard to, to survive on this money. There's also the huge aspect of just how to implement it. Like, will it play too often? Will it loop too early so people will get tired of it? You don't want people to necessarily start turning off the music when you want it to play, right? So the technical aspect of implementing it is very important. Is it going to be kind of like algorithmic? Is it going to be... Uh, like fading in and out stems. Like I worked on a game called Sable and we did a lot of work to make sure that we have this song, but if you go underground, a certain thing will kind of go away and attenuate. If you start climbing up and you kind of get this airy feel, then the, the, there will kind of be like this more, uh, more vocal harmonies and less drums. If you just finish climbing, for instance, it's going to sound a little bit different. And if it's nighttime and if you look up at the stars, it's going to be like a little layer that pops in. And all these things are really, really cool. And I hope no one ever, ever figures them out, right? Because they will just color the experience. And, and that is just, that took like as long, I think, to put in as this was to probably to record a thing, right? Yeah, so. that's an insane amount of time into that. I, we, the work we did recently was also at one scene. I think there's 11 layers uh, of like, where of like four is different intensity of combat, and then there's seven intensity of like exploration, depending on all of these things. And uh, there's like a crazy lot of time in in just implementing that. But then there's also the whole world of uh, like spotting that, like what needs to be here and what cues should we use and that can be done like weeks and weeks before the levels even exist like there's a lot of like theoretical work behind that as well and imagine getting that one month if like you have one month go do everything now yeah i mean it feels like that type of work should be planned out in pre-production with all the other plans right it would make so much more sense it would be very nice yeah sometimes it is i think uh, at this project we i made like it was almost like a sort of paid demo thing. Mm -hmm. So that was like, this, uh, speaking of coming in early, so, so I was like making one tune that was like su supposed to set like the tone for the entire project, which was a huge stressful thing also to like nail it. Uh, but then they used that as template music instead of like some random Spotify song that they can't use. And then they fell in love in that. And then it's almost impossible to replace because they will always love the temp music more. Uh, but then we were also impl impl implementing the, the middleware and stuff from like day one. And then I was out for half a year and then I came back. Uh, but I think that's possible, yeah, to, to, to be early in and like set the systems and stuff. Actually, the best way to make people come back and, uh, and bother you and think about what you do is to make very, 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 very ugly sounds. <laughs> and you put them in as temp sounds. It's going to be like... Argh! Like when you did something, so you open it. Well, every time you jump, there's like this ah sound, and you, and people will get in touch with you very fast about like it's in, it's in. Please, please fix it, fix it now. Ah, <laughs> so it's smart. It's not like I told my colleagues to to name all the you know working names should be like fruits, so they feel like they it can't pass the mm. the release right. <laughs> can't have a character called you know, can have a character called Kiwi though. That would be cool. I'd like to add another challenge also that okay. we didn't mention. It's uh, 
when you really finish the work, like when the track is finished. And sometimes I go back to it like 10 times. Even you already sent the final, you know, I go back to it like in some weeks or months and then I hear some stuff like I need to change and tweak and polish and, and maybe remove or add stuff. And then like when it's really perfect, it can be perfect. You, you can make excel, excellent, but you cannot make it perfect. And that's a big, big thing for me. <laughs> like, I can never stop improving and I go kind of crazy. <laughs> on that. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, an example of that was this latest project where I uh, was playtesting towards like the gold uh, submission. And I wrote like lists and lists and lists of places where the music were just like playing the wrong song, playing it backwards, just broken, broken, broken. Uh, and I fixed all that and I came up with a new list the next time I played this with 70 new points. And at the same time, uh, there were, they made uh, mock-up reviews where journalists get to like, write about the game to give, give the studio an idea of uh, what the press will react. And they said like, the music was so nice and the implementation was really, really working so well. So, so sometimes it's, you are the only one who will notice yeah. these things. And yeah, totally. uh, I think it's really important to also like, listen to people that don't understand what you do, like how they experience uh, mm. the things you do. I'd like to add to that that I love feedback that's not from sound people because they're, they're not the audience. I mean, like, it's cool to get technical feedback, but I love when people are like, I, I, I'm just a fan, you know, I'm just, I like games. And it was a bit weird to me. I didn't like, it was weird. And I'm like, what does weird mean? Let's figure that out together. And then they explain to you in, in their terms and you get to translate it. And that's, I think, like, super, super helpful and super important because they are the target audience, not sound people. I mean, I love sound people, but I don't make games for them. <laughs> They're very small. We're pretty boring. Very. We get I'm together and we talk about like, <laughs> yeah. what plugin do you use? I use PS5. Oh, I use PS50. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't get that yet. Oh, well, you should. Well, maybe I will next mor morning when I have payment. And then we have a beer and, and we go home. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're boring. <laughs> okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Step up to the mic. If no one steps up, I will tell jokes. Okay, no, don't do that. I have an extra... Uh, uh, our f we always have our final question if no one's coming. There's someone coming. Here's a bit of a newbie question. Uh, do you have any like tips on how to uh, determine whether a piece of music is actually done like presentable or yeah? Good enough threshold. Where is it? Um, personally, I like to just present what I'm working on as I'm working on it. Because uh, if I try to make something perfect uh, and then I send it and they don't like it or it's the wrong type of music, it's not the right vibe, then you're going to have to redo a lot of work that you spent a lot of time on. So it's much better to just send something that is very in like VIP and then send it. And if they like the vibe, then you can keep going. But if they don't, then you know that, okay, well, I didn't spend 50 hours on this. So totally agree. Well said. Yes, I can add also that I, I send it as a raw draft and I say that's the raw draft, that's the mood, the, the atmosphere, you can hear the basics and then if they say we approve the draft then I go to the first revision and then I send the revision and maybe some changes been applied to the game and maybe some stuff you need to change also in the music, then you have another revision and only after the second revision been approved I do the final and also, I feel sometimes you can feel really scared to send stuff that, that doesn't sound good because it's not finished. Uh, but on the other hand, there's like safety in that it's not finished. So you can always excuse yourself that, oh, yeah, I understand this and this and this and this isn't supposed to be final, blah, blah, blah. So it's, there's also safety in, in like uh, being really transparent and like this is a sketch, a work in progress uh, really early. And that also, I think, uh, builds on the relationship with the people you work with, that, that you like involve them in your process as well. Another question? Yes, hello. Also a newbie question. Do you uh, mostly work with uh, orchestral libraries or do you ever work with live orchestras? And if you work, I guess that it's a much bigger budget. And what kind of budget are we talking to um, have a live orchestra? Anybody work with a live orchestra here? 
not really, only with some musicians. I mean, uh, once we did a team for Battle Ride and I hired some musicians in uh, uh, Copenhagen, actually, in the studio there. And uh, I don't remember the budget, how much it was, but it was only like five person, I think. So it's not the full orchestra, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I really don't remember the, the money we spent. I think maybe 10 or 15,000 crowns something like that but it was like only uh, some um, tracks like so, some parts of the track were used as a uh, live uh, recording so not the whole composition we did a recording with Eurim choir up in Trondheim Norway um, it was like more like a collaboration so we uh, did an orchestral version of, of, a, of, a, of a song uh, for our game sunlight and that we had a proper budget of uh, a bunch of money uh, I don't remember how much, but we and then we had them for like three hours, and we rented a place that is uh, by the Nidaros Dome, which is a cathedral up in uh, Norway, like good acoustics, um, and, and then it, like with proper pre-planning and production, uh, and we hired an audio team to kind of have the microphones. We also had a lot of time extra, so we made a choir of 30 people do weird stuff, like making a <laughs> when 30 people are making that, it's actually a very good sound of a stream, and they were like. That kind of stuff, and we had it in like oh. binaural, 5.1, 7.1 stereo. It was very, very, very cool. Um, yeah, sounds amazing. Good yeah. planning, good, yeah. good, good yeah. planning gets you a lot of cool stuff, and you get to have time to so try that's stuff. Not a month before release. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I always use musicians when I make music for games. Um, I play a lot of instruments myself, but I don't play strings and um, most brass instruments. So always have, and it adds so much. And I usually follow Music for Bundets, like um, they have a tariff for what you should pay musicians. It's usually, a, the minimum I think uh, 3,000 crowns per uh, top th three hours per session. Uh, so that's what I go for. Um, so at this last project I was, I had the budget was like 10, 10 of those sessions. I was three or four musicians that came in like once or twice and somebody three times, so that's 30,000 crowns extra in the budget for that. Uh, and that depends like completely of how you work and what kind of music you do and what you need, but um, that's really good that there, there are like tables to follow when you're hiring external musicians. And for orchestras, I think if you should follow that, it becomes like hundreds and hundreds of thousands. So it's, I know it's crazy expensive I and mean, there are these like low salary orchestras in Poland that you can hire, which feels really strange, but there, it's a thing. Uh, that's used a lot in film the industry. The Melbourne Orchestra did that, but they were kind of go go uh, governmental sponsored, so they did a bunch of uh, game scores uh, over a few course of a few years. But they, yeah, they got funding from the government to do that kind of stuff. I would like to add that actually for the new game V Rising, I hope I can get an additional budget and uh, work with a girl who is sitting here in public, Celia. <laughs> Hey, I would like to have cello on our main theme for V Rising. So yeah, I would I would do my best to get the budget so we can work together and do some live music. No pressure, you are. <laughs> cool. Okay. We're actually out of time. Uh, if you had any more questions, I do assume that the panel will be just by here. If you want to come by and yes, say hi, come by and say hi. Uh, Bye, thank you. Thank you, all thank, you so thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.